Uh, welcome to the 2023 Drell Lecture. The Drell Lecture is a major event uh, each year for the Center for International Security and Cooperation, CSEC, for the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies, and for the broader Stanford community. Uh, this lecture was generously endowed by Albert and Cicely Whelan to commemorate the remarkable contributions of Sidney Drell and to provide a powerful public forum to address the issues for which he cared most deeply. Sidney Drell was a renowned theoretical physicist whose affiliation with Stanford lasted almost seven decades. He served in a variety of important roles, including deputy director of the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center, and beginning in 1983 as the co-founding director of CSEC. And I guess it is also fair to say that he also served Stanford in a very special way. His daughter, Persis, is currently the provost of Stanford. In addition to his many important technical contributions, Sidney Drell was also committed to public service, a commitment that made him a trusted advisor to multiple American presidents, to leaders of US intelligence agencies, and perhaps his most public contribution was as a pioneering advocate for nuclear arms control. I regret that I did not know Sidney Drell but in preparing for this event, I went back and read a sampling of his numerous publications. And what I found remarkable was his dedication to making even the most highly technical issue accessible to a general readership, to a general informed, concerned audience. This was not only because he was a gifted writer. The urgency of his concern always came through, but what also came through was a relentless humanity, a recognition of our collective capability that despite enormous challenges, we have the power to act, to change course, to reduce or eliminate existential risks, to offer not only a sense of hope, but to ground this hope in a pragmatic path to achieve real change, change that is in service to profoundly humane goals. It is with this perspective that the choice of our Drell lecturer this year is particularly compelling. Dr. Joanne Liu is a Canadian a pediatric emergency room physician and professor, professor at McGill University. She became world renowned as a global health leader when serving as the international president of Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders, or MSF from 2013 through 2019. Joanne began her work with MSF in 1996, working with Malian refugees in Mauritania. Since then, she has provided and coordinated emergency medical aid across the globe, including the Democratic Republic of Congo, Sudan, South Sudan, Yemen, Syria, and Gaza, and was among the first to publicly call for an urgent global response to the West African Ebola outbreak, while many regional experts and the World Health Organization were reassuring the world that everything was under control. Joanne has served on multiple international commissions and advisory boards and is currently a member of the Independent Panel on Pandemic Preparedness and Response established by the World Health Organization to provide an evidence-based path to effectively address serious threats to global health. Joanne has received numerous awards for contributions and commitment, and she remains a powerful and inspirational voice for humanitarian protections and humanitarian action throughout the world. My name is Paul Wise. I am the Richard E. Behrman Professor of Child Health and Society, Professor of Pediatrics here at Stanford Medical School, and Senior Fellow in the Center for Democracy, Development, the Rule of Law, the Center for Health Policy, 
and uh, CSAC in the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies. The program this afternoon will begin with Joanne's opening remarks entitled New Challenges for Medical Humanitarian Workers and Patients in Conflict Zones. Joanne and I will follow this with an exchange and conversation. We will then open the discussion for questions and comments from uh, the audience. After this, there will be a reception in the lobby to which you are all invited. Please join me in welcoming our 2023 Drell Lecturer, Dr. Joanne Liu. Hi, good afternoon, and thank you for braving what I was told was called a storm. So coming from Canada, you, you know, it's quite entertaining. Um, so that being said, it's my, you know, distinguished pleasure to be here today and then to come back at Stanford. I was here in 2020 uh, to come and then uh, to try to basically gather my thoughts to write a book that I haven't written yet, uh, but um, I hope it's going to be out in 2024. So what I've prepared for you today, it's, it's I'm not, I'm not a real lecturer, I'm, I'm a humanitarian aid worker who just want to talk about a few things. So um, we're going to start with a tale of an attack, few statistics. I'm going to talk about few contexts, and then uh, what are the, the inner challenge that MSF is facing. So let me talk to you about Kunduz Trauma Center. Kunduz Trauma Center was a hospital that we built in 2011 after a couple of years of negotiation in northeastern Afghanistan. And it was a hospital that I must say that every single inch was negotiated with the Taliban, but as well with the uh, governmental uh, authorities. It was a hospital who had ICU, eight beds, three operating theater, emergency room, and it was a place of healing. People knew that when they had a broken bone, they would come to Kunduz Soma Center. And so I visited that center in at the beginning of 2015. And this is, this is when we were doing rounds. And one of the things that, that really stayed with me about that hospital, it was about a 92-bed hospital, was the fact that um, we did things that we don't even do in Canada. We did rounds together. We, and this is the rounds when I am with the uh, ICU and then the surgeon, the physiotherapist, the mental health care worker, uh, the nurses, everybody's together. We do it twice a week. And it was the moment that, that we were making sure that everybody was getting the optimized care. And we, we, we were you know, having eye contact with our patient, making sure you know the that we were controlling their pain, and, and everybody felt safe there. We had people from both sides. We had people from the Taliban side, and we had people from the governmental side, civilian as well as injured combatant. And then in the summer of 2015, there were a lot of fighting. And the hospital ended up being right at the front line. And then we, we end up at the end of September having massive amount of people flooding in our hospital. In one day, 130 patients came, all wounded. Mostly civilian, 80% were civilian, 20% were combatant from both sides. And, and it was like one of those days that, that things get really, really busy. Then when you walk in the ER, you just smell the blood, and then you have people pulling on your clothes, asking to care for them. But when you have mass casualty, that some people will be labeled black, and it means that you will not do anything else and self palliative care. That's what we did. But at the same time, it was a time that the fighting was really intense between the governmental uh, uh, forces and the Taliban. And, and, uh, and, then, and then the team kept working night and days all the time. And two things happened just on October 1st. A, we got a phone call from the US telling us 
if our hospital became, became a Taliban all up? We said, no, everything is fine. There's no fighting in the hospital, and then we're just caring for patients who are, who are injured. And then we got as well a call from two embassies, the French and the Australians just say, telling us to pull out our international staff because we think they're going to be abducted. Fight continue, and then on, on September 28, uh, uh, the hospital flipped to the Taliban side. The Taliban came and see us and said, it's going to be the same thing. Don't have to change anything. We're going to respect a no, uh, no weapon, and everybody is welcome to your hospital. And so we thought that was it. And on the evening of October 2nd, things were really calm, so calm that the team ended up going outside because there were so many street bullets that they didn't want to go outside. But now they decided to go outside. And then our staff who were sleeping in the hospital end up as well going outside in the compound. And then at 2 o'clock and 8 minutes on October 3rd, hell came from, from the sky. An AC-130 gunship came and raised the hospital, the main building, from east to west, methodically, five times, bombing, gunshot, silence, deadly silence. 15 minutes after, bombing, gunshot, silence. This is the ICU. People burn alive in their bed. The sedated, the ventilated ICU patient were charred to their bones. Scream of despair. People died in pain. People died alone. People died slowly. This is a satellite picture. And, and I'm showing that because I was always amazed how much the bombing by the AC gunship, AC-130 gunship, was so precise, accurate. And I think that we were very, very, I would say, shocked by that because it was not the first time we were bombed as an organization, but it was the first time that we were insistently bombed five times, precisely, steadily, repeatedly. 42 people died, 28 patients died, 14 of my colleagues died, four caretakers. During the attack that lasted, we think it lasted one hour, the report from the US said 30 minutes, but nevertheless, we called everybody. We called the Resolute Air Forces, we called OCHA, we call the Afghan Defense, uh, Minister of Defense and Minister of Interior. We call the Pentagon. We call ICRC. We call everybody. During our call, someone told us we don't know what is happening. We're praying for you. We asked for an investigation. We wanted to know what happened, and we wanted that the investigation be independent. We didn't get that. We get a phone call of apologies from Barack Obama, and, and then we get an investigation from the US. And this is the punchline of that investigation. Human errors compounded by process and equipment failures. We were asking what, what we call the Independent Humanitarian Fact-Finding Commission. It didn't happen. This is, this is what we found out from the report as well. It's basically what happened is they were an intended target, apparently 400 meter northeast of, of where was the hospital. But the rule of engagement was a bit different. There were a call from, from the field, from the Afghan forces, saying that they basically there were hostility. And under the word hostile, people read, 
self-defense. And under self-defense, then, then you go on a mission and then you target whatever you think is the target. And, and that's what happened. They went on mission and they were very successful because they did target very well the main building. And, but they went with no goal list, no eye on the target. But they were successful. There's no more trauma center. So we were upset. And when you're upset, you either decide to remain upset for the rest of your life, or you decide to, to transform. And then so we decided to transform that. And then what we did is, of course, we did a petition that we ended up giving back to the, the, US, uh, the US government. But we call for a signal from the world order to tell us there are still rules in times of war. And so this is what happened. The resolution 2286 was voted on May 3rd, 2016, reiterating the fact that there's rules of war, that the medical mission, be it the hospitals, the patient, the caretaker, the, the staff, the medical staff, the equipment, the facilities are protected. And so, Kumbaya moment, unanimously voted, 80 countries backed it up. And then they mandated Ben Kimu, the Secretary General back then in 2016, to come back in September at the UNGA, United Nations General Assembly, to have a project of how to operationalize that resolution. And so he came back, but things have happened, many things have happened. And basically, we came back to the United Security Council telling that nothing has changed. We have been as bomb as ever in the field, in Syria, in Yemen, and then, and then nothing has changed in the field for our staff. But in addition to that, is, is, um, there's an issue. And, and what we found out is, is, and this is something I've said to people when I was here, when Scott, Scott, Scott Sagan was, was, I met with him in 2020, and as I said, what I think we did not measure well back then is the narrative of a mistake and the fog of war. Because after that, everybody used that same excuse. When they bombed a hospital fully protected, it was a, a mistake. And he ended up giving basically full, uh, what we say in French, a full boulevard for what I call full impunity. So when I look back at this, you know, I was very angry and then very sad. And then I think today, seven years down the road, how I look at this is quite differently. I think that when you wage war in those kind of circumstances, and when I was thinking, and I was just reading uh, Eagle Down, which is a book that is uh, following up, you know, from the military side, what happened during Kunduz, is the fact that when you downsize your military assets, in a conflict, and when you have to rely on the intelligence, not from your US, I would say, uh, uh, um, uh, intelligence, but the local intelligence, there's, there's part of risk. And, and I, think that, uh, I think that that was something that I overlooked back then, that um, it was doomed to happen. And a lot of people right now are saying that unless we address the systemic issue about the military, and I don't know if there's military people listening or in, in the audience, it's doomed to repeat itself. What happened is 16 people were supposedly to be reprimanded. Actually, 12 of them were, but many of them went back to, to, to reintegrate the military. And, and, and the, 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 the Commander Hutchison went back in 2018, if I'm not mistaken. So, but we're talking about attacks on hustle. But what, what is you know, the reality check? What, what is really happening? And we always thought that it was, there were more than usual, but we don't have any benchmark. So the AIDS, uh, what we call the AIDS, the AIDS worker uh, study, they, they're looking at how many attacks there is on, on humanitarian aid worker. And basically, it's pretty stable over the last 10 years, but with some peak you know, in 2013, which is most likely Syria, and more over the last year. 
The thing is, we don't have 2022, and everybody thinks it's going to be different for 2022. And so we'll look at them later on. But, but basically, when you look at 2021, 268 attacks, 40, 40, 461 aid workers were, were injured, and, uh, and then basically um, a, third, a third injured, a third kidnapped, a third who died, more or less. When we look at this, it's 57% of those, of, of those violence uh, events happen in five countries. The top one is South Sudan, Afghanistan, Syria, Ethiopia, and Mali. And all this is going to change with 2022. But what is interesting is to find out of what people are dying from, those humanitarian aid workers, because I know that some of you might be interested in that kind of, of work, is, is it's mostly shooting. But there is, you know, the second uh, biggest cause is airstrike and shelling. And this as well is going to change with, with, with Ukraine. So, and then w the last thing I wanted to say on that is, is the fact that we look at the, at the, I would say, the impact on humanitarian aid worker. But the reality is we need to know to whom it's really happening. And basically, 98% of the death are happening on national staff, on locally hired staff. 2% of the death are international staff. And then one of the things that we have seen over the years is a transfer, the transfer of risk to our national staff that is too often not acknowledged. So since 2018, WHO decided to have a surveillance system on attacks on, on, on healthcare, which is something that has been a follow-up of Resolution 2286. And then basically, if when you look at 2022, there were 1,185 attacks on, 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 medical, uh, on, on the medical mission, which is, which is everything, the equipment, the hospital, the caretaker, the patient, and the, and, and, uh, the physician, and the medical staff, and, and, and 232 deaths. And, and it's, um, this, is, this means it's about three attacks on a daily basis. But we cannot not talk of Ukraine. And I'm talking about Ukraine because this is one, one context that, that I think is we're beyond the fog of war. And I think we are beyond the, the mistake narrative. And, and maybe it's part of the strategy of not sparing the civilians. And when you look at the data, is 783 attacks were, uh, were happening in, in, in Ukraine. And which means 66% of the attack were in Ukraine, and 44% of the death were in Ukraine. So let's talk a little bit about Ukraine. I was in Ukraine in March and April 2022, and um, it's it's quite interesting because this is, has been the most, I would say, the most portrayed uh, uh, unused war. Uh, we don't hear about Ethiopia, we don't hear about Yemen, we don't hear that much about Syria, we don't hear about DRC, we don't hear about South Sudan, uh, we don't hear about um, the whole West African unstable area of Mali and the surrounding country. 38 head of states visited Ukraine in 2022. My president went, your president went. And, and it's, it, it's quite astonishing when you're there, the cognitive dissonance that you have on seeing a building like this, a hospital, that looks completely normal. And when you go inside and you see those main body, and this is, this is a 15-year-old child that I care for, that was when he was uh, fleeing Mariupol um, in the humanitarian corridor, he, he got shelled on. And so, the other thing is, other challenge that we had to face there, first of all, because it was such a CNN, I would say, portrayed uh, on the news all the time war, we started, even us before going, uh, we were a bit, you know, scared, but my God, was our loved ones scared for us. Um, I, I told my, my partner that I was going to, to Ukraine, but actually I didn't say that. I said, I'm going at the border of Ukraine, and, and he got chest pain, and we ended up being in the ER that night, and he was monitored overnight. And I just said, there's no way I'm gonna tell him I'm going into Ukraine. There's no way. So I didn't tell him. 
So, but just to tell you that, that our loved one was scared, we were a bit scared. And then it was the, one of the rare places I've been doing humanitarian aid work for the last 25 years of my life that the chemical weapon accident or attack was on our mind. And then we made sure that everybody got training on how to put their protective gear. And then I remember because I was, I, I, was, I was minuting them, and you had to be able to put your gear in less than one minute. So in Syria, we did practice, but not as much. We were practicing every single day, and everybody had their, their equipment. So it's a different thing. So we went there, we wanted to do, we wanted to do surgery and ER work, and what we ended up doing, we ended up doing transfer of patients. We ended, because when we asked people, when I went to the hospital in, in Saporija, and then just at the entrance of Mariupol, or when I went to Bakhmut, or when I went to Kamatos, they just said, we don't want you. I said, how many, like I went to one of the big hospitals in Saporija, I said, how many uh, surgeons do you have? They said, 242. I said, oh, I guess you don't need my surgeon. So we decided to go, and, and they just said, but if you want to help us, he said, free bed. Free bed here, close to the, the front line. And then we're going to be able to continue to be able to welcome patients who are injured. And then so what we end up doing, we end up, being, we end up transferring patients from the east part of the country to the west part of the country. But what we end up doing it was not as much, you know, the war wounded people that we were transferring, but it, it's always the same thing in any, any crisis, is the extreme of age are the most vulnerable, the young and the elder. And why? Because when there were alarms of missile coming and you have to go and run in the bunker, these are the two groups who could not do it. The elder couldn't figure it out if they were, you know, having cognitive issue, and then the young ones just could not, you know, figure it out. And so we end, up, we end up transferring them. And then this is all our, our train. And we, 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 we end up doing you know, hundreds and hundreds of those transfers. I could not talk uh, not about Sam, about Syria. Uh, and, 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 and it's because it's, uh, it's, it's their decade of, of war. Uh, and this is the only place where over and over again we've been undercover in terms of our hospital MSF. And we had you know, a hospital in, 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 uh, in, uh, in cave, hospital in, uh, in chicken house, hospital in hotel, hospital in, in apartment building, because it was the only way to be able to work undercover. But when you do work undercover, it means that you don't have the protection of the, the IHL, the International Humanitarian Law, and it means that, that you're on your own. And I remember well as well, even the one, the hospital were not undercover, they were very clear, they didn't want to share the GPS coordinates uh, with, with, uh, with, the, um, with, with, with the, the authorities. So and when you have a war without limits, people are gonna flee. You know, there's 6.7 IDP people in Syria. And then, and then this is, I, I wanna take a few minutes just to talk about that. This is Idlib after the earthquake. So we all have seen, you know, the earthquake. We have seen the pictures. And what is interesting about the earthquake is A, our, how much is our empathy towards the victim of the earthquake in Turkey, Syria. More than 95% of the aid went to Turkey. Less than 5% went to Syria. Although Syria is much more in, in I would say, in, in, in dire needs. And, 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 and the fact that in, in Syria, there was like real challenges to get the aid. Uh, since the beginning of the war, there'd been some what we call the cross-border aid happening. And, and basically, it's been a challenge. Every six months, we renegotiate the agreement at the UN Security Council to do the cross-border aid. The last time we did that was January 9, 2023, fortunately. But the other thing that makes a huge difference and that will make a difference for us aid worker, and we've been negotiating for more than seven years, is the resolution that happened, the 2664, which basically is allowing a, a transfer of money to United Aid Organization in territory in where they are working, if it happens to be in a territory that is held by, what, uh, by a group that, we, that is considered terrorist. And so, that makes a huge difference because before we were liable of being uh, terrorists by bringing support or working in a terrorist area or labeled terrorist area. 
So there's probably going to be a resolution that's going to make much more difference in our life as a humanitarian than the 2286 resolution of uh, May 3rd, 2016. And I could not, not talk about Africa and then, and then the fact that it's, it's, it, there's so many uh, conflicts happening that never gets, never gets the public attention. And I wanted to talk about you know, some of the difficulties we had. And one of the major difficulties we had was with the Ebola outbreak in 2018 and 2016, 2019. And the fact that um, it's, it's, it's our center to treat patients with Ebola got burned down twice. And, and there was different reason. But one of the main reasons, and it's my explanation, but I might be wrong, it's, it's, it's the fact that the government decided that it would be a governmental response. But the epicenter of the Ebola outbreak was in the opposition area, in the eatery and in, 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 uh, in, the, um, in North Kivu. And so people were, didn't want to, uh, people didn't want to, to, to be care in our center. They thought anyway the disease wasn't existing. They thought as well that we were importing the disease. And they were as well telling us you know, this is coming from the government. How can we trust them? We've been at war with them for so many decades. And so, and the reality is what we need is not that. And we've been telling you what we need is water. That's the only thing we want. It's clean water. And so, all this to say that I think that the other inner challenge that we have as an international aid organization, it's, 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 it's how we are and this white savior complex and and how we're struggling to decolonize you know, our organization. And then last year, there were like a, a, a petition in our organization in MSF where more than 1,000 people said there's institutional racism in the organization. It was the same thing in the Lund School of Tropical Medicine. And I think that we need to address that, and we're still not there yet. And I, I believe that, um, that uh, the new ecosystem needs, we need to bring us much more humility in what we're doing. And, and I think there needs to be such, some real deep down solidarity. We need to ask people what they want. They need to be in the driving seat. And there needs to be some sort of social justice. So this is all I wanted to tell you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Joanne. We're going to spend a few minutes just in conversation. Uh, Joanne and I are uh, good friends, but I'm going to try to ask difficult questions. Um, talk more about what you call asymmetric empathy. This, the recognition that there's enormous focus on places like Ukraine for important reasons, of course, but that the uh, toll and suffering in Tigray um, remains largely invisible uh, in the West. How would you begin to address the asymmetries in empathy and response? Well, oh, that's not easy. Um, I think that um, we need to talk about it. So first of all, um, it's, it's never covered on the news or, or really covered. So if it's not covered, if it's not on, on people's radar, how can they be able to think about it? Um, but but uh, we know that the, the, the number of casualties in Ethiopia was more than in Ukraine uh, last year. And, 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 but the reality is, is this, so there's partly of that. And, but I think about Ukraine is the fact that, like it or not, it's a bit when there were the war in the Balkans. When it's close to us, when people look like us, we feel more empathy. And we don't want to tell, we don't want to admit it, but that's the way it is. And how has it affected the attraction to MSF and other humanitarian organizations, the recruitment of health workers and humanitarian workers? Are there differences in the interest of people to work in different parts of the world? Well, absolutely. There's, a, there's always crisis that people want to go. Everybody wanted to go to Ukraine, and everybody wanted to go to Ebola. For Ebola, remember, Ebola. We don't really have a good treatment. The vaccine are still under trial. We always have a waiting list for people to go to Ebola outbreak. 
you never have a waiting list to go for cholera in Yemen. No, nobody wants to go. So there's, there's this thing, there's some sexy crisis and there's some non-sexy crisis. And, and it, it's, it's the reality. Uh, I think that we have a duty as academic to talk about those forgotten crises instead of just surfing you know, the CNN wave. Thank you. You can hear me better. Great. Um, and what has MSF done to alter this uh, approach and the sexiness issue? Anything successful? No, we talk about it and we, we bear witness on, on the different situation. But then, then you may put something on your website and that's what we're doing. But I remember when I came back from Yemen in 2015, I was not able to get an interview. I, I was just not able to come back. And we thought it was sexy. The international prison is coming back from Yemen, has been doing hands-on in the most remote places of Sada, you know, the epicenter of the war. Could not get an interview. Just could not get one. And, and it's the same thing about the migrants. It's really hard to get an interview on migrants. But you can get all the interview you want on Ukraine and then on the, on the Turkey earthquake. Not on the Syrian part, on the Turkey part. Just following up on the migrants, you're talking about migrants at the U.S. northern border uh, coming into Canada? Yeah. <laughs> it's an issue. Talk yeah. more about it because it seems to increasingly look like the same political divisiveness that has characterized our southern border in the U.S. Oh, absolutely. I think it's more of the same. And, and the thing is, it's interesting because uh, the Canadians were really, I would say, uh, freely criticizing the U.S. For their, for their measure. But when it's knocking at their door, they're the first one to say, close the Roxanne Row, uh, and, then, and then push them back, and then we don't want them. And then, so it just, it's, it's until it knocks at your door, you have no clue how you're going to react. Yes, I can attest to that same response here in the United States. I want to go back to what you were talking about in the Ebola response in the DRC, um, in the Eastern DRC, in the Kivus. Um, it's true that clearly the local communities had a different perspective than the humanitarian organizations like MSF working in those areas. But there's a broader issue of how humanitarian organizations interact with local communities when there is this new imperative for localization, for decolonization. How do you navigate uh, these issues? How do you begin to address localization and giving greater power to local groups um, when there's concern that the perspectives uh, may be so diametrically opposed to the perspectives of the humanitarian organizations themselves? Well, I don't think we're that successful, to be frank, um, because the biggest issue with MSF, and I'm not sure because I'm, I've, I've, you know, I'm not with them per se right now, is the fact that because it's without borders, there's right now an internal debate that to be able to do something, you need to be from another border. You need to come from another border. And so there was this whole struggle on, on the lo localization of aid. So we having our own specific issue because that's part of the definition of, of what is an msf -er. It's, it's you, you cross a border to come and bring aid. And so this localization needs to be uh, uh, embrace, uh, but, but it's, it's, it's not happening fully yet. And how do you see the risks of localization playing out? Um, it's been clearly embraced by many organizations throughout the world, but what risks do you see, if any? Well, I think the, the, the main thing, and, and this is why I was talking about the Ebola outbreak, is the fact that I really thought that it was one of the rare circumstances that we should have had an independent, neutral, and, and impartial uh, response and not being embedded with the government, knowing that you were in the position area. 
And I think it would have made much more sense. And we didn't fought for it because we, we wanted to play the game. We wanted to do this localization thing. And then, and then basically, and then, and then when we started to remove ourselves from the government, we were more accepted. Well, one of the clear risks of localization is that most communities in these areas have some affiliation with one of the combatant groups or political organizations in the contested areas. So it'd be very difficult to maintain neutrality if you're empowering local groups to act uh, for the provision of humanitarian services. Well, I think I would push back on that to a certain extent. I think that every year in MSF, we debate the fact if we should just throw by the window the word neutral. We don't believe we're really neutral because I think, I think we're playing with the word and because it serves you know, our image and it serves everything. Now I can say that, I'm not the president anymore. So, but, but, but the reality is, 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 is by default, but when you try to be somewhere, you're somehow siding by default. And, then, and, then, and this is how it's perceived. You know, like in, 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 in Afghanistan, it was very clear that the fact that we were so close to the front line, close to the Taliban, and they were Taliban combatant injured in our hospital, never sat right with the Afghan authorities. So, so for them, we had lost our neutrality. But not for the Taliban. There was some protection because they perceived extent. it as a relatively neutral position. Yeah. And is this actively being navigated in not so much places like Ukraine, but in other areas where you have um, contested territory by multiple, really a proliferation of armed non-state actors, where neutrality is always in play? Yeah, it's always in play. I, I think our way to address it to a certain extent was to multiply the number of centers that we have in all the different territory to a certain extent because it cannot, it's not always feasible. Uh, but that's why, and this is why we're trying to always work on both sides of a conflict. But as well, it's not always feasible. Uh, but right now, for example, we work in Ukraine, but we work in Russia. So, and then we haven't stopped our Russian project. We've been having TB project, you know, for decades. And we still work, you know, we're working for the civilian population. And how do you approach neutrality in the face of witnessing atrocity by one side? And how do you. You make... warned me that you would ask me this question. So they have no excuse not having a spectacular <laughs> answer. Come again? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, there are some classic examples of of groups that have tried to maintain neutrality even though they're witnessing a profound atrocities and criminal acts. And the embrace of neutrality always seems to trump the requirement to create a witness narrative of atrocity as clinicians, as humanitarian workers. How do you see this playing out in your experience but also in leading uh, an organization as diverse, powerful, large as MSF? So Paul is probably alluding to what happened in the World War II, I would imagine. It, it's a classic example. It's a classic example of what happened in World War II with, with the Red Cross and with, with the deportation camp. Um, and and um, the way we try to deal with that is to bear witness. And do, we say témoignage. But, but it's bearing witness on what is happening. And then you can do it to a certain extent, and then sometimes you, you do it and, and there's a price to pay, you get expulsed from the country. And it did happen to us on few occasions. Uh, I've taken those decisions. So when you decide to do that, you may as well go for it big time. But this is, this is you don't go halfway. You say, if I'm gonna get you know, evicted from a country, I'm gonna get evicted for a good reason. So, so, so that, that's, that's what we did. You know, when I went to the Libya, the detention center, it was the most cruel incarnation of women, uh, of men, uh, cruelty. I, 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 
I had nightmare about it and, 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 and how we treated people. And, and I remember when I came back and told my, my, my team, I just said, we're going to do a, a press conference and we're going to tell the world that right now we're keeping in detention migrants that the only, only, I would say, fault is they decided to leave their country for a better life or for their life. And now they're stuck in a detention center held by militia that have no, no ethos, no ethics of anything. They are abusing them. Pregnant women are being raped over and over again. And they, 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 they strip people, they force them to run naked under the sun. It's unbelievable what they are doing to people. And they are doing that under the public money of the EU. And so we just went to the EU and we told them that. I remember so well talking to the humanitarian um, EU commissioner, I think. He was really tall, Avram Poulos. And then I look at him and I just said, I am telling you, look at me. I'm sure this is true, exactly how she's telling it. I said, I am telling you that when things, these things would be known to the rest of the world, the people who didn't fight for the people in detention center would be pointed with fingers. The guy sent me an SMS that evening. Tell me what I can do, Dr. Liu. And what role has, or what voice has MSF uh, given to the atrocities in Ukraine currently? What do you mean? In terms of the injuries to civilians, cl either clear targeting of health facilities or civilian uh, areas by uh, Russian uh, missiles or airstrikes. Has MSF um, elevated those potentially criminal acts publicly? Or is there more of an, a requirement to lay low? Uh no, I think we've been talking about it. We, have, we haven't been, I think, I think we've been discussing about it. We've been, I've been given a lot of interview, I remember when I came back. But the thing is, we don't need to do much more for Ukraine to a certain extent. It's on the news every single day, honestly. It, it just, it just, it's, it's, it's not a forgotten. You know, 38 head of state visited Ukraine in 2022, despite the fact that it's at war. It's, it's, it's not a small number. So, so we've, been, we've been doing that, but, but as well, uh, every time that we do an interview, we talk about other conflict because we think they, sh they, should, get, they should get a bit of, of, uh, of, of spotlight. Uh, so, um, so, but one of the things I think I didn't, say is, 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 you know, when, when, we, when we denounce a situation, especially what happened with the attacks on hospital and we talk about Kunduz, one of the discussion we had priorly to this, to, to, to this discussion is the fact that we go at people that we can go at, meaning that we could, we could publicly shame the U.S. because they felt so guilty it was so easy uh, uh, to a certain extent. Try that. Try that with, with the Russian or try that with Syrian or the Iranian. There's no way. Or the Saudian. You would be kicked out of the country. You would, you, you, you would get reprisal big time. So I'm saying that. I would never have said that five years ago. I'm saying that now because it is clear that, that, that uh, uh, we had this, this space of maneuver uh, and, and, and to a certain extent, you know, we should, uh, we should at least acknowledge that. Um, if we could go back to what you described quickly going undercover in Syria. Um, what prompted that shift in strategy that was pretty distinctive from other um, MSF uh, strategies in other locations? And what are the larger implications of having to go underground um, like that in, in other locations where the fear of the combatants and the lack of protections for humanitarian workers 
is so profound. It's too complex for me, that question. Sorry. The you know that I'm French. I just, it's, it, need, it, need, it need, you know, a subject, a complement, a verb, and that's it. Okay, we're going to hear about this later, I'm sure. Um, basically, you went underground in Syria. That's yes. unusual for MSF. Usually, you're very upfront, flags waving. Um, what prompted that change in strategy? I'll stop there. Because we were targeted. We had the feeling that we were targeted anyway. We thought that, that having being under the ban, ban or, uh, a ban, or say, or the flag of a hospital being known to everybody was putting us more at risk than the opposite. But then the flip side of, si of that, like I said, is in, it means that under the international humanitarian law, you're not protected anymore when you're undercover. And has that been an MSF strategy in other locations? That's a good question. Um, not sure. Most times you pull out when you're in, when your staff and facilities, your patients are in that kind of danger. I'm just trying to get at, is this a new kind of strategy that humanitarians are going to have to adopt and basically seek alternatives to the protections traditionally provided by international humanitarian law? I don't think, I think that it's, it's not that to pride on MSF or anything, but I don't think there's many, many organizations working in those very tough environment. The reality in tough conflict area, honestly, there's always exception, but often it's, it comes down to MSF, ICRC, the International Red Cross Committee. And then, and then sometimes you will have a, a local whatever organization. But it's not as if you have dozens of them. So uh, I'm, I'm, and I don't think that, in that respect, I don't think that ICRC, knowing them, they will go undercover. Yeah, I think that's true. I think they have not. Um, I want to switch gears. We're sitting in Silicon Valley. And what do you see as the potential for new technologies, digital, mobile technologies, to enhance protections, deconfliction, if you will, for humanitarian organizations and for the communities of greatest concern? Yeah, he told me, he will ask me that question, and I said, I don't have an answer. So I still don't really have an answer. The thing is, is, is what I was telling this, this morning when we dis were discussing and preparing, I just said, I find it fabulous that, that uh, uh, we are in a time that we send robot on Mars planet, but there's like equipment, equipment failure when there's an attack in, in Afghanistan and, and, and then we mistakenly fire a hospital fully functioning. I have problem to reconcile that. Um, I, I have problem that, that, that the equipment doesn't work. So when we talk about fancier stuff, I just said, until those e basic equipment works, I don't think I, I, but I think there's room for AI to a certain extent, and everybody has seen the drone, and everybody has seen you know, the delivery of medicine and vaccine by drone, and then, and then, and then everybody's trying to find a way, and one of, the, one of my pet projects is working on on, on the medical file of migrants because, because people don't want to carry the medical file with them because that might stigmatize them or that might, that might, they might get identified as, as something that they don't want to be identified with. So we're dreaming of having a cloud that is non-hackable and that is really safe uh, that, that people can, can, can put their medical information in the cloud and when they go and then exit at, at the other, at point B, when they start at point A, they can retrieve the information. I haven't been able to do that yet. So you hope, my hope is maybe Silicon Valley, yes. Great, well, thank you, Joanne. Um, we're now gonna turn to the part of the program where we uh, Joanne will entertain uh, questions from the, from the audience. 
We also have a number of people online uh, as well. Any comments, questions? I know there are people in the audience with a lot of experience here. Abdul? Well, thank you so much for coming and speaking to us and for all the difficult questions you asked. Uh, you mentioned, you kind of touched on this at one point, but a lot of aid uh, for, for conflicts often come, is funneled through the, the nation state that is in charge of that area. And like thinking about Syria specifically, um, uh, with the Assad regime, this was a large issue during the conflict where a lot of aid was being funneled through the state authority, but the state authority is the one who is committing a lot of atrocities, and this can be, this is the case in other conflicts. Could you touch on how, um, if there's been any push to rethink that paradigm um, when it is an internal conflict and it creates a huge bias in who is receiving aid and how that is being distributed on a medical perspective? Yeah, that's a very good question. And this is why the reason uh, uh, we've been fighting of the cross-border from Turkey. Because when you do the cross-border from Turkey, you go directly to the opposition area, and, and uh, it's not going through the uh, central government. So these, these are the type of thing we fight all the time for. And, but I would say that, that what the war on terror measure has brought is the fact that, is the fact that there's some group uh, that are labeled terrorists. Um, government, some government cannot engage with them. And we've seen that over and over and over again. And so what, and what, what is happening in those kind of circumstances is the humanitarian aid worker become the communication bandwidth for them. This is what happened in Gaza Strip. This is what happened in, 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 in Afghanistan with the Taliban. This is what happened as well in part of, of northern Syria. So, there's a disconnect, you know, like you, you may want to have those measures because it looks good on paper, but practically speaking, there's, there's issue and there's problem with that. Please, over here. Hi. Thank you so much for sharing with us today. My name is Divya and I'm an undergrad here studying computer science and political science. Uh, my question for you is if you could talk a little bit about when you're going to a country or providing aid, if you or the organization have experienced any harm from misinformation on social media or mistrust. So the question is if we had mistrust or misinformation on social media? Have you experienced any hardship because of it? with providing aid. But we don't use social media per se, so I don't understand the question. I, I, the question is more about like misinformation that would be around how you're providing aid and mistrust of external forces. Can you, can you explain to me? Um, yeah, I think, for, let me give an example. The White Helmets, um, uh, an organization, a local organization in Syria providing immediate uh, response. Uh, became uh, world renowned as uh, a humanitarian organization. And because of that, they became the targets of social media and misinformation that was attempting to undermine their public presence. And uh, social media misinformation, purposeful, um, can affect how local communities or governments perceive the role or contributions of humanitarian organizations. In your experience, have you seen where disinformation or targeting of social media has made it more difficult for MSF to operate? I'm sure, all the time. It's like if you take, you know, when, when there was the attack in Kunduz on October 3rd, 2015, and the government said that we were a Taliban control uh, 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 center, and it was relayed and relayed by the media and social media. That had tremendous, tremendous impact on, on, on our work and, and how we were perceived in the country. Huge issue. Um, same thing, you know, about Ebola in DRC. And everywhere, when you are somewhere where um, your operation is, is is not in align, you know, with what the population wants. Yes, of course. Yeah, I I, I get bullied all the time. I I all the time. 
I've, I've actually, I've, I've decreased by 90% my activity on social media because I just couldn't take it anymore. Uh, so yeah. But the thing is, what is interesting, for example, in Syria, they were using social media all the time to, to expose victory or non-victory or, or whatever, and sometimes it was a bit over the top. But that's what, as well, you know, what Ukraine is doing, you know, all the time. So, so we, we're living in, those, in this era, and we have to live with it. But I think it's hard for people to differen differentiate you know, what is oversized, uh, what is real, what is unreal. Very difficult. Over here. Okay. First of all, thank you so much for speaking with us, and especially thank you for bringing up the Libya issue. Um, my question pertains to MSF's work in Libya. Um, so a lot of uh, people, like MSF has withdrawn from a lot of detention centers because of the horrific like human rights violations that are occurring. And I'm wondering what the balance is between the ethical dilemmas of giving care in those contexts and also understanding that these migrants may only receive this healthcare if MSF is there, as oftentimes the militia groups and smugglers will extort them or they won't take them to the hospitals around in the area because, um, because of obvious reasons, so. Yeah, I'm not sure you know what is our footprint today in, in Libya because we, 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 we have closed a fair amount of, of our presence, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Libya was one of the rare places where we had mental health staff for our staff all the time. And um, I remember very well one of my a nurse, it was a Canadian nurse actually, because we had this patient who has been starved in, in the detention center. We hospitalized them, we hospitalized him, then went back to the detention center, got starved again, and then we went back to the hospital with us. And then basically, this is where you know we had to do something because it doesn't make sense to continue. Um, so, so, but the thing is very difficult to work in there. Um, and, then, and then I remember that nurse, the Canadian nurse told me, this mission is fucking my mind. And, and so, so at one point you have to decide, you know, so I, I, I'm not part of that. This, 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 I'm saying something that happened in 2017, 2018. But just to say those, those, those mission where you're not able to reconcile your you emotion with what you're doing and, 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 and what is the whole outcome of it um, uh, is, is something. And the thing is, is we get kicked out as well all the time because every time we speak out, then, then the authorities don't want us there. So this is this is the sort of back and forth thing uh, uh, about the Libya Center. But I think we need to continue to be there, and I think we need to speak up. And then I remember when I was there, and then I asked the people in detention center, I said, "Should we stay?" As I said, it's so trivial what we do, honestly. You know, we do like first aid stuff, and then when you're really sick, we remove you from, from the detention center to put you back, you know, a few weeks afterwards. And the person told me, but we still die less when you're there. What do you answer to that? We decided to stay, but it's tough. And I know now that we have less mission than we used to have. Thank you so much. Um, I was wondering about, given the global scarcity of medical and humanitarian workers, how do you prioritize regions, conflicts, and, and think about those decisions both across organizations and within MSF? Well, we have a team who does that at full time. I used to be part of the <coughs> operation. And, um, and then it depends you know, on our means. We have a, 
operational budget of about um, 2 billion euro a year. So this is a fair amount of money. And then, um, and we work in 70 countries more or less. So we have some money issue, but not that much. And, but it's according to needs. And according to needs to which we are able to respond and making an impact. Because otherwise we could be everywhere. And then, and of course, we, we, we humanitarian, it, so it's, it's, it's responding to needs, and it's a developmental project, per se. Kelsey. Uh, as the people said, thank you so much for coming. My name is Kelsey, and I'm studying international relations and human rights. Um, something you mentioned earlier was um, that you, you said you couldn't get an interview when you came back from Yemen, um, but you didn't have trouble getting interviews when it came to the Ebola crisis. I was wondering if you could expand on that a little bit of what you mean by interview and um, what has been the role of journalism and news coverage um, in your work and especially bringing light to conflicts that we've spoken about are go un invisible. But when, when, when you look at MSF, you know, we, we were created in 1971 12 people in a bit in a response on the fact that if we were to continue to do work, and you know, things have changed, but back then the Red Cross decided they couldn't bear witness and do public speaking, speaking up on things. <clears throat> so that's the reason why MSF came about in 1971. And so 50% of the people who started MSF were journalists, 50% of them were physicians. All this to say that, that, that media and communication is part of the DNA of MSF. And so we always use it as much as we can, but sometimes they don't want us. So of course with social media, you can make your own things and put the, what you, where you want on your website. But the reality, if you don't get you know, an interview with Amin Poor, you know, on, 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 it's as if you know, nothing has happened to a certain extent. I'm exaggerating and caricaturing, but there is this thing about, about I mean, the relay of the media to, 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 to make sure that, 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 that the world's gonna pay attention. And, and, uh, and the reality is, so they, they gave us an interview when it's a topic that, that's gonna sell, that's a topic that th their audience wants. And their audience doesn't want to listen about Yemen. They don't want to hear about Yemen. And I remember for the migrant that summer, I couldn't get no interview. But remember that little boy on the, on, 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 on the beach? The little airway? So I remember I was in a meeting in London and I got the anchor of CBC Canada. I just say, this is, this is your chance, Johan. Have you seen the picture of that boy? We need to talk about the migrants. And you know, the thing is, 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 is you, you do it. Because, because you know you have, to, you have to do it because nobody talks enough about, about the migrants. But you, but you see, there's a cycle of news and, 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 and sometimes, you know, what, what, wherever you are might, might be in the cycle of news, but sometimes it's not. And then you fight to get a space. And it's, it's hard, it's hard. But like, for example, for Ebola in 2014, 20, uh, 2014 2016, to, to 2016, the summer of 2014, the movement of MSS at, at the peak moment were making an average of 500 interviews a day. We would have tried to make a campaign about MSF and we never had the budget to do that. Everybody wanted us on the news back then. Dean? Thank, thank you, Dr. Lube. My name's uh, Dean Winslow. I always say it's a name, not a title, but I'm a professor of medicine here at Stanford. I'm also a retired uh, United States Air Force Colonel. I served 35 years as a flight surgeon. I deployed twice to Afghanistan and four times to Iraq. So, you know, I know, you know, the bravery and everything, and also just want to say up front, I'm a huge fan of MSF and have been and will continue to be. I just want to make a kind of a quick statement, though, particularly for some of the younger folks in the room, and just my concern when you started out, you know, with that horrible um, mishap that occurred, uh, you know, in Kunduz in 2015, I was still serving in the Air Force then, 
And I just want to be sure that everyone understands that there's no moral equivalence between that horrible accident that killed 42 people and the deliberate cruelty and depravity that, that the Taliban exhibit every day. You know, I've taken care of young girls and women numerous times in Afghanistan who had gasoline thrown on them by their husbands and lit on fire. You know, and I just want to be sure that all the young people here know that this mistake that was made, a tragic mistake, the United States Central Command took full responsibility for, for that happening. And so it's, there really should be no moral equivalence. So anyway, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. I have a question from one of our online uh, participants, Anand Habib. Um, thank you, Anand. It's been a while since we've spoken. Would you share what MSF has been able to accomplish to improve access to medications and vaccines through negotiations? You're talking about COVID-19 or are they talking about what? I think more generically, but maybe start with COVID. Because on COVID, I don't think they have done much. This is why. I, I think I've done more from, from what I'm doing now. But um, I think that, that MSF has been key but with, with the civil society especially during the AIDS, and the AIDS pandemic in, in, in the late 90s and, and, and the fact that we've pushed you know, for access to generic. And so uh, I often say um, that I think it's, one, it's probably one of the biggest legacy that MSF would have leave is the access to, uh, to ARVs for HIV AIDS patients. So uh, we were part, but it was not only us, we were part of the civil society who pushed for that. But, but it, I mean, countless, you know, uh, life-saving uh, treatment for people. Alan, no, Michelle. Thank you. It's great to see you again. I, I actually did not even recognize you when I first came in because you're even younger than when I saw you last. Um, uh, you know, I think inspired by Dean's comment, I also ha have a statement, which is I'm not sure that I agree with the position that if you go underground and don't mark yourself, that you lose your IHL protections. You're still not a military objective. You're still civilian, right? It might. Um, yeah, so I, I think you're still immune from attack and the responsibility is still on the attacking force to determine that you're a military object and before force can be used against you. So that's the statement. But Dean's question does make me wonder, MSF was very public and critical, understandably, of the attack on the hospital on Kunduz and for some of the reasons that you said, has been less critical of, say, Russian attacks, which I believe and probably you believe are on medical facilities in Syria are intentional. And I'm wondering what are the factors that would lead to your judgments about when to go public against a government and, and when not? I think we always go public, but then there's the intensity of, of how you go public. And I think for, for I think, I think yeah, like I said, I think the difference for Kunduz was its five air strikes on the hospital. We could not understand why we were not having, but we had, since then, we'd had several discussions with the, the, the Department of Defense, and, then, and now we have you know, a red phone and we can access, and then we, we have those things. But it, 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 we could not understand why, when you call people, telling him you got the wrong target, they're not able to unplug. And, 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 uh, and so this is something you know, that has been addressed to a certain extent. Um, so, um, so yeah, you know, I, I think that uh, uh, there was this trend of, 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 of and there's still you know, a trend of not sparing the civilians and not sparing hospitals. And we've seen the data about that. And then yes, you know, we speak up, you know, a, 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 you know uh, I remember doing it because I'm the one who did it for several years uh, against the Russian, but you, uh, they, 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 they it's, it's a different ball game. They harass you, they're, they're, they're hard with you. And then at one point, you know, you do it, you do it, and then you just say, well, 
how far can I go? We've, we've done a press conference and the guy was like barking at me and accusing me publicly doing a press conference, saying I'm lying and, 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 and this, is, this is how things are. So the thing is, 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 and this is why I said it publicly and I just said I, I think that we, we do do it differently. So what you're saying, I totally agree. I, I'm, but the thing is this, is, this is the same thing, is why do we always complain about the UN and the WHO? Because they're such, such soft target. You know, the reality is the member state who doesn't do their job in many, many, many circumstances. This is, this is why I said it very candidly, we go at people that we can go at. Michelle? So we go at everybody, but we go with more intensity at the people who give us the room to do it. They, to be honest, you know, it's just, it's just I could lie and tell you that that's the reality. Um, so two quick questions, Joanne. Uh, one is operational and one is personal. Uh, on the operational, MSF often goes into areas of natural disaster as well, like earthquakes. Um, hundreds of humanitarian organizations usually descend. Um, how do you wind up balancing it or are you working on your own? Do you interface? And the second question is a personal question because I get asked a lot of times, you know, from young doctors wanting to do humanitarian work. And um, how do you balance, I know we've had discussions about this, how do you balance your life with humanitarian work and how do you prevent burnout? Right. So I'm very bad with, with sequential. What's the first question? The first question is, is about- operational you... coordination with all the groups that will come in in response, particularly to an acute natural disaster. Well, in earthquake is a bit different, uh, but um, because yes, it's a CNN, there's, two, there's many people, and this is why for the longest time, uh, MSF was not going because we couldn't get there in time. Uh, this has improved, but the reality, if you want to do the rescue part, you need to be there in the first few hours. If you're not in the first few hours, and then you have like three to five days, depending on the environment, to save people out of, of, of the, uh, of, of, of the, I always say that, the, 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 the broken building and all that. So that, 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 that's one thing. And then you, you, you coordinate. The thing is, 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 and then we need to improve, and I always said that when I was international president, we need to improve to work better with people. But the reality, we're one of the rare organization that comes with their own funds and then can be operational as soon as they set foot on, on, on the country. And often all the other organizations, they're winning, they're writing grants, they're winning for money, they, they uh, yeah. So j j just to say, so we try to coordinate. I don't think we're the greatest, uh, 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 I don't think we're the, the greatest organization. I think we're trying to improve, uh, but I think there's largely big room for, room for improvement. And then on the burnout, I, 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 I know people ask that, and, and we had the discussion this morning, Paul and I as well, and, and, and I'm someone who just say that this is, um, it, and it's hard to articulate that in, in this kind of, 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 in the time we're living, but working in crisis zone, being in my ER in Montreal, or being in, being in Turkey, uh, in the earthquake, uh, it's, it's what has been the most meaningful for me. So I don't burn out in doing something meaningful, even if it takes a big toll on me. But of course, you know, I, uh, I'm, I'm someone who doesn't have children, so I don't have a family, and I don't have to, to juggle with that as a variable. Would you be willing to share a bit of what went through your mind when you went to visit Bakhmut? in Ukraine? When I visited Mahmoud? Yeah, the concerns you had about that visit and what you were thinking and what your colleagues were concerned about before you made that trip. Oh. <laughs> no, no, but it's just because it's, 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 I think that when you have a crisis like, like, like Ukraine where you keep having those image it's just because when, we, when I went to Ukraine, at the beginning, they only sent people with experience. I ended up going with people with experience 
uh, uh, that have been doing mission for the last 25 years. So we were three of us, like old timers, who've been working together for 25 years. And then that morning I was leaving with, 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 with my team and, and we had two cars. And the head of mission woke up, which is like an old timer, it's Christopher. We know each other. And he woke up at six o'clock and come and hug me. I said, oh my God. I said, he comes and hug me. I said, I'm going to die. <laughs> And, and, and this is what happened in your imagination. Ukraine, you know, was so much on our, our, the picture we saw and then the, the, the you know, it, it, it's been a, it, it's what I call, you know, the, the, the indiscriminate, I would say, targeting on civilian over and over again. Was for me, as I say, I'm gonna go and, and I think something's gonna happen to me. So it, it's one of the rare time in my life that I went on a mission, that's what I was confiding to, to, to Paul, that I said, I don't think I'm gonna come back in one piece. And, and that was double hammer for me because, because I had lied to my spouse, telling him I was going on the border of Ukraine and Poland. So, so, so now my biggest, my biggest fear was to come back injured because I said, oh my God, he didn't want me to go. I brought him to the ER, got chest pain the day I told him I was going, and, and now I'm gonna come back and I won't be in a one piece. So yeah, I, f I felt tremendously, uh, so I, I had decided, I remember I was in the train at one point being evacuated and I thought I would never come alive of that. And I said, if the train get hit, I need to die. I just don't wanna survive. I just need to die. So I had made up my mind. Does that answer your question, Michelle? <laughs> Good. Well, I'm going to close this part of the uh, session uh, and uh, recognize the contributions that Joanne and her colleagues at MSF have made. The world of humanitarian health is a world of con contradiction. You see the worst and the best in the world. You see horrible cruelty, but also courage, resilience, and sacrifice. You see high ideals, but you also see nightmares. Uh, Joanne has witnessed the worst and the best of the world. She's witnessed terrible cruelty, but also provided with her colleagues uh, the best in the world. Thank you for your presentation today for this discussion. And thank you for all you do for communities in need in some of the poorest and most violent places on earth. Thank you. <laughs>